I know that I have less than four hours to talk, so I better get going and talk fast because I've done a lot of work with this guy and I want to say as much as possible. I want to begin with a big question. And it's a question I assume somewhere in your life, no matter whether you love history or not, you've asked yourself, why do we do this? Why do we study history? And let me suggest that there are several wrong answers, wrong approaches to that question. One thing we do, and we do this well, hopefully, is to try very, very hard to get every detail and fact right, to make sure we don't make any kinds of mistakes that would lead us to an anachronism. The most famous anachronism in history is when they were filming the movie Ben-Hur, and they discovered, for example, that one of the charioteers during the filming was wearing a watch. You want to avoid those kinds of things. But there's a problem with that way of doing history. It can very easily become antiquarianism, where the goal is to collect data in the same way your goal might be to collect coins. Collecting coins is fine. Collecting data is fine. But it's not the same as doing history. Because it may be entertaining to be an antiquarian. It's not particularly useful to society, except for the fact that it preserves material that other people can use. The other approach, it seems to me, is to ignore most of the details and say, hey, I want to apply history to me and to the world I live in. And the problem of doing that without great care is the fact that most people that claim to do that don't pay much attention to the history part. In many ways, what they're looking to do is find something in the past that justifies what they believe about the present. And so there are a lot of ways in which history is done badly or misused or manipulated. You know, that annual thing in some newspaper, why the United States is or is not going the way of the Roman Empire. I haven't read a good one of those yet because I've never read one where the person was either careful in thinking about the present or knew much about the Roman Empire. So I want to suggest that what we're going to be looking at tonight is really a kind of way of doing history better. That is to say, we need to get our facts right. We need to do that sort of hard work but then the question is not, well, now we've done that, we're done. We got our 94 on the test. The question is, how do we apply it, not literally, but creatively to ourselves and to the society around us? Because ultimately, history is a creative form of thinking. It requires a lot of hard work, and you can't play with the facts. But ultimately, the purpose of history is not to accumulate facts and not even to make grand pronouncements about the present or the future, but rather to really understand the past in such a way that we can borrow and use certain things in a world very different than the world in which those ideas or institutions were created. You know, you can go back and look at the origins of democracy. That's a very important thing to do in ancient Athens. But really, we don't want to have Athenian democracy here. Right? Imagine how chaotic that would be, not to mention the fact that none of the women would vote, uh, none of the people born abroad would vote, and of course, uh, the slaves wouldn't vote. So, you know, what you do is you say, what is it that Athens did and establish certain principles that we can now practice in different ways than the Athenians themselves did? That's sort of the way we do history in a useful way. Now, let me suggest at first that St. Francis is not a very good candidate to be useful. First of all, he lived a long time ago. He's been dead almost 800 years. He lived far away. Uh, Italy is, and I was just there a week ago, so trust me, not exactly like North Carolina. And I might add, Italy now is not very much like Italy then, although some of the buildings, and I might add traffic laws, still survive. But let me tell you how different Francis's world was than ours. First of all, it was an era of the Crusades. Francis, who lived 44 years, lived through four Crusades, three against Muslims and one against the wrong kind of Christians. Secondly, most people were illiterate. Third, most people, the great majority, were engaged directly in agriculture. Fourth, the economy was largely a barter economy. And finally, this is the real big shock for modern Catholics, almost everybody went to Mass. That doesn't sound much like our world, and somebody who lived in that world, however well he lived in that world, what is it he can tell us? What is it he can show us? What path can he point us toward? Well, as we know, if we're historians, one of the ways we can answer that question is, let me restate what I just said. Let me tell it from a different perspective. The period Francis lived in was a time of severe conflict 
between Christians and Muslims, as well as a time of serious disagreements among Christians. It's true that most people were illiterate, but it was also the time that the universities, the grand institution of which we all participate, were just beginning to develop. Third, although most people lived on farms, it was an age of rapid urbanization, especially in Italy. And beyond that, it was also a time when, although most of the economy was barter, money was being reinvented and the introduction of money was changing things radically. And finally, it is true that most people went to mass, almost everybody. It's also true that increasingly, Christianity became formulaic and remote. It was in Latin, uh, and most people didn't speak Latin. And it was therefore something that many people simply went through the motions of. We have a hard time documenting that, but it seems reasonable to conclude that. Well, those ways of describing the 13th century don't sound totally unlike our own century. In fact, they sound surprisingly modern in a lot of ways. So if we state things correctly, we can at least say maybe this guy Francis has something to say to us. And let me suggest some of the things I think he says about these topics. It was indeed the age of the Crusades. Francis, in fact, actually went to visit the Fifth Crusade in Egypt. He was appalled by the Christian's behavior. He crossed the enemy lines and went to meet with the Sultan, and they got along just fine. They had talks. There was a possibility that Francis would be killed, but there's every reason to believe from the surviving evidence, A, that Francis and the Sultan liked each other, and B, from Francis' own later writings, it seems he actually learned some things from the Muslims that he could apply to Christianity. In particular, he wrote a letter to all the rulers of the world that says, at the end of the day, send out messengers to call out to all the people to remember to praise God. Christians hadn't done that. Muslims had five times a day. And so it was very interesting to see that Francis realized, while I'm sure he thought he had some things to teach the Sultan, he also discovered the Sultan had things to teach him. And that's certainly an important basis for peacemaking. But in other ways, too, Francis realized that making peace needed to be creative. Those of you who are as old as I am will remember that during the Vietnam War, the Paris peace talks began. And the first 18 months of the Paris peace talks, as people were dying in Vietnam, some Americans, many Vietnamese, the debate was, what shape should the table be? 18 months they had that debate before the negotiations started. I want to suggest that Francis would have never been trapped in that kind of, well, these are the rules of diplomacy, and we have to play by those rules because they're the established rules. And let me tell you two stories. One of them is certainly historically true. The other one may be somewhat elaborated, shall we say, but I think they're both useful to us. Let me do the elaborated one first. There was this mean old wolf outside the town of Gubbio that was, among other things, eating people from Gubbio, which is not a terribly nice thing to do, at least if you're a person from Gubbio. He, the people were so scared they wouldn't go out of the city walls. Francis comes along, and they said, Francis, do something about this. So Francis goes to meet the wolf. And he says, Brother Wolf, that's the way he greets the wolf. Let's talk. Now, of course, the wolf isn't talking, but we have to imagine this happening. What he wanted to know from the wolf was, why are you eating people? And he was able to figure out the reason was there was no food in the woods for wolves. So Francis had an idea. Do you think that if the townspeople fed you, you would be willing to stop eating the townspeople? And Francis, according to this story, brought the wolf into Gubbio and introduced the wolf to the terrified people who are around and said, we got a deal to make here. You agree to feed the wolf. The wolf will not eat you anymore. And peace was made. The second story is probably more literally true. Francis was very ill, but the mayor of Assisi, called the Podesta, and the bishop were at each other's throats, one threatening to cut off any kind of secular authority, one willing to excommunicate the mayor. So 
Francis said, I'm too sick to go see these guys, but he'd already written a poem about Brother Sun and Sister Moon. So he said to one of the friars, I want you to go sing that poem to the mayor and the bishop, and I want to add a verse. A verse about blessed are those who, who pardon one another. And so they went off to sing to the mayor and the bishop, and the two made peace. Now, first of all, I want you to think about these two stories together, because wouldn't you sing to the wolf and make a formal deal with the mayor and the bishop? Francis did it backwards, not the way we would expect. And that, I think, is an important thing for us to say, that making peace is creative. And to go back to the wolf story, what does Francis do? First of all, he says, brother wolf, not you crummy old animal that eats people. That isn't a very good way to start a conversation. He refers to the brother, to the wolf, as brother wolf. Secondly, what does he do? He finds the root cause of the problem. The problem is that the wolf is hungry and there's no food for the wolf. And third, then he tries to resolve the problem where both sides benefit. People don't get eaten, wolf gets to eat. Okay, pretty good deal. Well, again, whether that's historically exactly the way things happen, it's a story that goes way, way back into the early times of the Franciscan legend. And I think those are both pretty good stories to help us think about doing peace in a way that doesn't just follow formulas. Francis dared to be different. Francis dared to be outrageous. And in a world with so much violence, maybe we need to be a little bit of outrageous. Maybe we need to ask the right questions as we approach the attempt to make peace. Secondly, I said it's the time when the universities are being formed. But what Francis realized is, and see if this rings a bell to any university people, academics very often enjoy winning verbal battles more than finding truth. Right? Professors are like that. Right? We're, we're, we're an armory lot, by and large. We like to get the last word in. And Francis worried about that. Because I think, as we read in some of the sources, Francis basically thought this way. The purpose of knowledge is to become better, to become more loving. So what if you studied love as a philosopher and had all these different definitions of love, but you didn't become a better lover? What's the point? That the, the quest for knowledge is a means to an end and not an end in itself. And Here's one of the ways Francis put it, according to Bonaventure. Francis was asked, you know, what should friars do? And always he answered with the example of Jesus. He says, well, we read that Jesus prayed more than he read. So if we're going to imitate Jesus, we should pray more than we read. But because we aren't around Jesus, the only way we know Jesus prayed more than he read is that we read it. And therefore, yes, of course, the pursuit of knowledge is important, but it's important for the purpose of being able to follow Jesus rather than to win an, rather than win an argument. And I think Francis saw something. He, he respected learning. He called the most learned of all the friars his bishop. That was St. Anthony of Padua. But nevertheless, he recognized some of the dangers that were already developing in these early universities. Let me say something about the urban life and also something about the money economy. You know, there are always poor people. I live in a rural area. You live in roughly a rural area, as far as I can tell. Don't see too many skyscrapers. And one of the things we know is poverty can be hidden in the rural world. And also, the people that live out in the country can probably forage in the forest and maybe find a little food. But when they move to the cities and there are no jobs or there are no homes, they're separated from their families. They're separated from any immediate source of food, that urban problems bring the poor more visibly. You may not see people on heating grates in your town or mine, but you sure see them if you go to Rochester, New York, near where I live, let alone if you go to New York City. And so the, the problem and the plight of the poor was becoming more dramatic and you, you couldn't escape from it. You can live in my town, probably in yours, and pretend there's no desperate poverty. You can't do that living in any city. I was just in, in uh, Southeast Asia. Believe me, you can't do it in Rangoon, Burma, and so on. And furthermore, we have this move from a barter to a money economy. And one of the things that does is you, it's very easy to know who the winners and losers are, who's got the most coins. And 
if you start using money very soon, everything is for sale. I mean, not just food and your local neighborhood chariot dealer. You can buy sex. You can buy friendship. Right? You'd be surprised how many friends rich people have. And Francis realized that the world was changing radically because of the combination of urbanization and a money economy. And he addressed it in an extraordinary way. He dropped out of the money economy. He did not drop out of the cities because the cities had God's poor who needed to be ministered to. But he joined them in their poverty. He didn't ask anybody else to do that. He didn't say, hey, king, hey, pope, hey, mayor, get rid of everything like I have. But he lived as an example. And it's important to realize what kind of an example that is, because let me tell you what drove people crazy about Francis. You know, sometimes you can imagine, gee, I'll not have my computer, I'll not have my iPhone, I'll live out in the woods for a day, you know, chew on wood. I can do that, but God, is it going to be miserable. Francis had nothing, and he was happy. And you know what that did? If you have nothing and you're happy, then that in and of itself refutes the idea that wealth buys happiness. Because he had none of one and a lot of the other. According to an, a famous novelist writing about Francis, Brother Leo used to say, well, you know, I can sleep on it with, my, with a rock for my pillow. I can do all those things. But God is miserable. This guy loves it. It's the joy of Francis that was the most powerful commentary about the role of money and the, the, the material world than anything else that he did. It was simply Francis being Francis that was so important. And finally, Francis realized a lot of Christians were simply going through the motions. You know, say the Stations of the Cross, actually they hadn't been invented yet, I'm being anachronistic here. Um, you know, cross yourself at the right time, use the holy water, go to confession once a year, you have to take communion once a year, you know, punch my ticket. And so Francis tried a radical experiment. On Christmas Eve of 1223, in a little village called, Gubi, uh, called Greccio, Francis asked that they bring in a manger, no, no, no baby in it, a manger and an ox and an ass to be at the altar for the midnight mass. Do you know what animals do, whether they're inside or outside, if they're around for two or three hours? That's exactly what Francis wanted them to do because that's exactly what happened the night Jesus was born. He wasn't born in a palace, born in a stable. Cows didn't say, oop, Savior's born, can't poop tonight, right? Doesn't work that way. Francis knew all that, and he loved it. Because what he wanted people to do is not just to commemorate the birth of Christ, but to experience it. And he developed a kind of, ex a, a kind of experiential Christianity that still is an important part, not the only part, but important part of the Christian tradition. You want to be there. The, the manger scenes that you have in your homes or in your churches or whatever in, at Christmas time are a direct descendant. Of course, we have little statues. They don't poop. But I suppose now they could make a technology where they could make them. But at any rate, the, the idea is still, again, to try to be present, to try to imagine what it was like that night when God, who could have come into the world any way God wanted, chose to come in in a stable in a backwater part of the Roman Empire. And if you can experience that, you're on your way, much more so than knowing how to genuflect or anything else. Francis wanted an experiential Christianity. I might add, Francis also realized that a lot of the preaching in the formal liturgy, although it was done in Italian, was basically done using model sermons in Latin, and they tended to be very learned and very long. Francis preached outdoors, no liturgy, in Italian. He'd break into a song in the middle of his sermon. He was an entertainer, because if nobody listens to you, what you have to say isn't very important to what you're doing. And so Francis brought a kind of vernacularization of the church, as well as bringing this experiential theology. So I think maybe you can see from this that maybe Francis of Assisi does have something to say to us today. And therefore, although imitating Francis doesn't mean wandering around Italy barefoot in a robe, uh, because that's not what it means today for us to imitate Francis, any more 
than Francis imitated Jesus by heading to Palestine and hiking around. But rather, we know that the question is creatively, how can we use the life of Francis, the insights of Francis, the spirituality of Francis, in our own day, given where we live and given where and who we are? Well, let me switch gears now and tell you that in 2013, exactly two years ago, there was one of the most shocking, extraordinary things that Catholics had ever seen. There was a papal conclave when there was still a living pope. Despite what CNN told you, that had not really happened since 1294, when Pope Celestine V resigned. There was a kind of forced resignation when there were claimants to the papacy, three different ones in the 15th century, and that's what CNN picked up on, but that isn't, that isn't really a parallel. So it hadn't been since 1294 that a pope, if you will, freely resigned. And there'd been a conclave when there was a living pope. So that's one extraordinary thing. The second, of course, is that when we look at the election, we discover it's somebody from the New World. The last non-European pope was pope in the 8th century. It's been a while. The pope was a Jesuit. Been a lot of Jesuits in the world, never one as pope. In fact, not only had every monarch in Europe and the Americas kicked out the Jesuits at least once, the Pope actually suppressed the order for a while in the 18th century with its surviving only on the edges of Christendom, which at that time, Western Christendom, it meant in Poland. So we've got a conclave with a living Pope. We've got a Pope from the New World. We've got a Pope who's a Jesuit. And to me, that's not the most shocking thing. You hit it right on the head when you said what the most shocking thing is. He called himself Francis. And it really is interesting to think about that because most of us don't get to rename ourselves. And he had a chance to rename himself. He had lots of choices. He could have been the 17th Benedict, the 24th John, the 3rd John Paul. He'd have been a lot of different things. He chose a name no pope had ever chosen, the name of Francis. And so we have to ask, What's going on? What's in his mind? What might this tell us about him? What might this tell us about how he's going to be the leader of the Catholic Church? Let me suggest that from one point of view, it's foolish to call yourself Francis because every Catholic either knows or thinks he or she knows something about Francis. I mean, he is the superstar saint, right? I mean, if it's Jesus Christ superstar, the, the next one down is Francis superstar, okay? <laughs> Everybody loves him. Uh, you, you know, you, you've got your St. Francis medal. You've got your St. Francis statue. Uh, you've got your St. Francis birdbath. A lot of those around. <laughs> Everybody loves Francis, and rightly so. Episcopalians name their church after Francis, right? Orthodox write novels about Francis, Nicholas Kazantzakis. Everybody loves Francis. But how can anybody take that name and expect not to be criticized because you're not living up to who Francis is? He took on an extraordinary task because even in the Middle Ages, if people wanted to criticize any of the new religious orders, Dominicans, Franciscans, Augustinians, or whatever, they always picked on the Franciscans because everybody knew something about Francis and obviously the Franciscans who were wandering around the streets of your town weren't up to his standards. Some of them weren't super skinny. Some of them had habits without patches. Ready for this? Some of them dared to wear sandals, something Francis never did. How do you live up to that? So the friars were consistently criticized by people like Chaucer, people like Dante, people like Langland in the 14th century. And so you know you're setting yourself up to a comparison and you're gonna lose. It's just inevitable you're going to lose. But, the other thing to say is that immediately this showed up. A few weeks ago in the Rochester, New York paper, there was a letter to the editor, I don't know what caused this, from a woman who was so mad at the Pope because she hadn't read anything he's done as Pope for birds. Right? Francis and the birds, Francis priest. She thought she had a bird Pope and she hadn't read anything this guy did for birds. Obviously he's a failure. I'm sure this was a good Catholic lady, I might add. Okay, so how do you win if the comparison is constantly going to be Francis? You can even buy magnets 
you can buy Magnus of anything, you can buy Magnus in Rome that show Pope Francis facing St. Francis. If that's a sparring match, you know who's going to win, at least in the eyes of anybody who has that magnet on his or her refrigerator. I think one way we can get to what Francis the Pope is thinking of when he chose the name of St. Francis by looking at two incidents in Francis of Assisi's life. First of all, in the year 1206, he's sort of wandering around down below the hills of Assisi. He walks into a church that's sort of falling down, and inside is a actually fairly new painted crucifix. It still survives, by the way. It's the most copied cross in the world. And according to tradition, as Francis is praying there, Jesus speaks from the cross and said, Francis, go and repair my church, which you can see is falling into ruin. And good old obedient Francis did exactly that. Bricks, mortar, stone, the whole bit. In other words, he responded very literally. That's the best he could do right now. But Bonaventure tells us that later on, he and others came to understand that what God, through Jesus, was saying to Francis is, go and repair the capital C church. Because the capital C church was corrupt and, and perhaps too politically powerful and so on and so forth. And therefore, Francis of Assisi was by definition a reformer of the church. Just think what the word means. Reform means to form again. It means something was formed, something got deformed, and now something needs to be reformed. But the earliest biographer of Francis, a fellow named Thomas of Chilano, in whose hometown I slept the other day, Thomas of Chilano wrote, he repaired an old one, he didn't build a new one. He used the foundations of the old one, he didn't tear out the foundations. And I think that really is the metaphor for Pope Francis as a reformer of the church, because clearly, he, as reformer, was, on the, uh, in the, was in the minds of many of the cardinals who voted for him in the conclave in the Sistine Chapel. And so we've seen Francis in many ways already starting to repair the church, sort of cleaning up the Vatican bureaucracy as much as he's able to so far. And certainly a lot of what this pope is going to do is institutional reform of some sort because it seems to be crying out for that. On the other hand, we should not assume that all reform of the church simply is changing rules or changing people in the bureaucracy. When Francis washed the feet of Muslims within a month of assuming the office, that was also repairing God's church. When we see Francis embracing those who have severe physical deformities, when, he, when we see him inviting homeless people to breakfast with the Pope on his birthday, that's reforming the church. He's not merely an institutional reformer any more than Francis was. Francis had no effect on the bureaucracy of the papacy. But what Francis did is reform the church by the way he lived his life in accordance with Christ as he understood it. And I think this Pope is going to be not just in the institutional sense, but in other ways too, a reformer of the church. Just last week, a homeless man who begged in St. Peter's Square died. He was from Germany. And what the Pope decided was he would be buried in a little German cemetery inside the Vatican, mostly with bishops and princes. That upset a few people. Reform always does. But that's also reforming the church. It's more than institutions, although it includes that. The other story I think that's so important is the fact that when Francis had sort of a conflict with his father, over the fact that Francis had actually used some of his father's property, sold it, and bought stones and stuff to repair the church, the father finally said, that's it, kid. You're out of the family. I'm reading you out of the will. And we're going to separate all of our property. And so in public, before the Bishop of Assisi, probably the year 1209, dad basically says, give me back what's mine. And Francis did. Started to take off his clothes. And Although this is not in the sources, I, I want to add this. I bet you that when he got down to his underwear, Dad said, keep the underwear. <laughs> but he didn't. He stripped stark naked in the square. The bishop sort of embarrassedly wrapped part of his coat around him. But what happens next is what's important according to Bonaventure. Bonaventure said that Francis looked up to the heavens and said, for years I've talked about my father being Pietro Bernardone. That was his father's name. But now, for the first time, I can freely and truly say that my father is our father who art in heaven. It was the liberation 
And it was this recognition that ultimately our Father is God the Father because God's a creator God. And I would argue that Francis spent the next 17 years of his life until he died trying to figure out and apply what, that, what the implications of that are. You know how a lot of us are. We, we come up with this really good insight, and then we start seeing that the implications are fairly radical, and we sort of back away from it. Ah, that can't, he can't mean that. Jesus can't mean, you know, fill in the blank, right? But I think Francis thought about this for the rest of his life. And think about what the implications are. Of course, if you're made by God, and you're made by God, then by definition, since we have the same parent, we're brother and brother, or brother and sister, or sister and sister. And of course, that means the Pope is my brother. It also means the leper is my brother. So is the Sultan when he shows up there. And wait a minute now, God didn't just make people, God made animals and plants. It's also brother if I may say so, in an Elon context, Brother Oak and uh, Sister Fish. But wait a minute. God also made rocks and rivers and planets. And so, as Francis himself sang later, it's also Brother Sun and Sister Moon. If you believe that, if you believe that, not as a metaphor, if you believe that, what are the implications? What do you learn about how you treat your brothers and sisters? Well, you don't exploit them. You don't manipulate them. You don't do anything that you think is to, will damage them, no matter what they do. And Francis tried to live his life that way, with other human beings, despite what their earthly status is, how they looked, how they smelled. None of that mattered. What mattered is, that's my brother. That's my sister. And when he preached to birds, well, wouldn't you urge your brothers and sisters to do what God called on them to do? Because that's exactly what Francis said to the birds. Hey, birds, God made you to fly, fly. It's the same message he gives to people. God made you in his image. Now act like it. It's the same call. And therefore, Francis tried to live a life. It's hard to do. Obviously, you have to eat something. But as much as possible, he tried to live with, the ex with accepting for him the fact that everything that is is a creature of God. Everything that is is his brother and sister. And one of the things about this pope is he's already, in his very earliest speeches as pope, talked about the fact that it's the obligation of Christians to care for the earth. You mentioned that St. Francis is the patron saint of the environment, also the patron saint of animal protection societies and shelters and so on and so forth. And now Christians, there's a universe out there, all of which is our brother and sister, something that I think even St. Paul implied in his letter to the Romans when he talks about all the earth is groaning for the redemption by God. We're all in it together. And Francis tried to live that way as literally as you can. Not all of us can live that literally. Not even all of his brothers and sisters who were Franciscans lived as literally or as close to that as he did. But nevertheless, that's the goal. By the way, this year, Francis had promised us a major encyclical on the environment. I'd watch for that. I think it's going to be a little bit radical and a little bit testy uh, for some people. Now, as the kind introduction suggested, I wrote a book about 25 years ago called Francis, The Way of Poverty and Humility. Bad title. I realize now the title should have been Francis of Assisi, the, the, and, and it should have not only poverty and humility, but also simplicity. I want to suggest those are the three most extraordinary virtues in the way that Francis lived them out. Now, poverty, humility, and simplicity don't exactly sound like they describe the papal office. Right? You've got a rich church, you've got a powerful leader, and if you think you're busy, look at his date book and his calendar. He's a busy guy. He's also a head of state just for other things. So let me suggest that although the qualities that at least I associate so much with Francis don't seem like a very good fit, let's ponder some things here. How does the Pope creatively try to live in humility, simplicity, and poverty as Pope. Okay, That is, I believe, his challenge. I believe he knows that's his challenge. And let me suggest some ways. 
Let's talk about poverty first. Now, again, Francis had nothing. But Francis was not a scold. He didn't go around to everybody else saying, I'm wearing a robe that I'll give away to somebody poorer than me, but you think you own that dress. That's not the way Francis operated. He got along with everybody. He got along with lepers. He got along with the Pope because they're his brothers and sisters. And Francis, the way he lived his poverty was not at all as a scold. And as I pointed out, it wasn't something he lived in misery. It's something he lived in joy. Now, obviously, Francis had simplified a lot of things in the Vatican. He doesn't ride around in a limousine. He carries his own briefcase and all those sorts of things. But he's also dealt with the most outrageous behavior by some of the leaders of the church. There was a bishop in Limburg in Germany. You might have read about him. He spent more than 40 million euros designing a new house and chapel for himself. That word got to Rome. I believe what we call that fellow now is ex-bishop of Limburg. Okay, he's gone. But this is the best part. Okay, we, we aren't there yet. That building is now going to be a food pantry and a shelter for the homeless. Okay, this is a new pope. This is a guy that has somewhat different way of looking at his job as well as looking at the world and seeing a particular way to imitate Christ. Uh, I don't know where the former bishop is, but he's not in Limburg, and he's not in his 40 million, 40 million euro place. I think that's really interesting. I think what Francis believed is that all the things we call our possessions are really not ultimately in some final legal way ours. Everything belongs to God. They're all God's children. The cloak you're wearing is God's child because God made it. And therefore, God, in a sense, loans us things. And sometimes, we're going to be asked to give them to someone who needs them more than we do. That doesn't mean we have to run around naked or in rags. And Francis the Pope and Francis of Assisi never said that. But we have to realize that we have an obligation with the property that we have. And in some final analysis, it's not ours. And by the way, I, I, wrote, I wrote this speech a few weeks ago, but Francis the Pope said exactly that four days ago. Of course, Lent is a time of penance. Lent is a time of reflecting on some of these things. And that's exactly a message the Pope gave at, at his audience last week in Rome. Very interesting. We are not the owners. We have it on loan from God, and God might ask us to pass it on. Doesn't mean God will. God might ask us to pass it on. How about humility? Now, the fact that he's the Time Magazine Person of the Year head of a state and on occasion infallible, or at least in principle on occasion infallible, not exactly a list of things that we associate with humility. But let me tell you two things about Francis of Assisi that I think the Pope has learned. First of all, there's a famous story where Francis, he's sort of, even by Francis's standards, sort of grubby, and he gets to a Franciscan friary late at night, he's been traveling, and when they open the door, they don't recognize him. And they throw him out. And Francis' response is, I have to treat that rejection exactly the same way I would treat a warm reception. Or in other words, for this pope, don't believe all your press clippings. You've got you to listen to your critics as carefully as you listen to those who praise you. And I think the pope understands that principle of humility. But one of my favorite stories about Francis is not one that gets painted very often. It isn't a very paintable story. Francis walking along one time with one of the friars, and the friar says, well, Francis, what do you think of yourself? And Francis says, I am the greatest sinner in the world. Now, I'm sort of paraphrasing this, but basically, the friar says, oh, come on. You know, that is incredible. Uh, you know, there are muggers and all kinds of awful people out there. What do you mean you're the world's worst sinner? And Francis gave a really interesting answer. Francis said, I know what gifts I've received from God and I know how poorly and imperfectly I've used them. I don't know what gifts anybody else has. And therefore, I know that I'm a terrible sinner. I can't speak about anybody else because, again, I don't know what God has given them. And when Francis made that famous, famous statement on a plane going to or from someplace, when he was asked about gay priests and his answer was, who am I to judge? That's exactly the story about St. Francis I thought about that he doesn't know what God has given that particular priest that he may be dealing with. We're talking about gay priests. We're not talking about pedophile priests. We're talking about gay priests. And 
that answer of the Pope, I think, shocked a lot of people. It didn't shock me in quite that same way because I thought, well, that sort of sounds like something St. Francis would say. It, it is that wonderful notion, recognizing your own failures. Those you can evaluate. Those you can go to God and say, mercy, mercy, mercy. But I don't know what you've been given. I don't know what God has done for you. And therefore, I really don't think I'm in a position to condemn you. And if you read the, Pope, the Pope's book that he wrote with Rabbi Skorka when he was the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, that's not a surprising statement for Francis to make at all because he talks about counts, count, counseling priests who have, who have engaged in sex with women, priests who are you know, fallen madly in love with a woman. He talked to, talks about all these priests. And, and again, that's his answer. Who am I to judge? It's a very interesting answer by a man with all those titles and theoretically all that power. How about simplicity? Well, Francis lived about as simply as you can live, right? He had three things usually. He had underpants. He got another pair. Um, he had a cloak and he had a rope for a belt. And that was pretty much it. And even they, again, were borrowed in a sense from God. Well, certainly, Pope Francis has simplified his wardrobe and whatever. There's a wonderful cartoon that came out in Rome a few days after the Pope was elected. And it shows the Pope walking across St. Peter's Square carrying his briefcase. And here are two cardinals that stop him and ask him questions. And, hey, Holy Father, you paid your hotel bill. You're carrying your own briefcase. You ride around instead of a crummy car. Your cross isn't even made of gold. What's the matter with you? And in this cartoon, the Pope looks up at him and said, oh, gosh. I'm sorry, I must have misunderstood. I thought you elected me to be the successor of the poor fisherman and not the Roman emperor. <laughs> I doubt if the Pope said that, but wouldn't be surprised if it crossed his mind a couple times to want to say that. Now, obviously, the Catholic doctrine, as you look at it in, in the catechism, or if you want to read Thomas Aquinas, right, is pretty complicated. He's the guardian of all that. And that's a complicated task. But the question is not whether the doctrine is in doubt. The question is, how do you read it and how do you live it in a way that makes it good doctrine rather than a burden to be carried? And I think Francis is at work on that. And I think the story I like from the life of Francis of Assisi that best leads us to this, one day, and for those of you who know medieval history, you'll appreciate this. We're going to have a straw man in this story. And it's a Dominican. What do you do? So anyway, this Dominican comes to Francis one day and says, Brother Francis, there is a passage in Ezekiel that is driving me nuts. I have read every commentary. I've studied it over and over and over again. Dominicans do that. And it's still just driving me crazy. Francis said, what is it? There's a passage in Ezekiel that says, if you see sinners and don't rebuke them, God will hold you responsible for their sins. And he said, you know, Brother Francis, I see people sinning all the time. I don't go over every single one and rebuke them. And this is Francis's answer. If you live your life well as a Christian, you rebuke every sinner. You don't have to point fingers. You don't have to be a scold. That by the way you live your life, you are stating what you believe to be the truth, what you believe to be God's will, and that's a rebuke of every sin and every sinner. And I think the Pope knows that story. And I think the Pope lives by that story. And it strikes me that that's what he wants to say. If you want to know who I am, I'm, I guess you can read my encyclicals. But watch me. That's the test that I'll either fail or I'll succeed in. And I think that is indeed a very Franciscan idea. And if you say, who am I to judge? If you say, I've got to live my life well, rather than spell out to you 42 pages of tight logic as to why you were wrong about something, think what that opens up. First of all, Francis is, is open to ordinary people. He's not talking to theologians. That that's not his job. There are people whose job it is to talk to theologians. They say they're professors in seminaries. That's an important thing. But his job is to be the pastor of a flock of more than a billion people. And I think his simplicity, his inclusiveness is important. For example, he invited, and the invitation was accepted, the Greek patriarch in Constantinople, Patriarch Bartholomew, to come to his installation. That had never happened before. He's already met with the Armenian patriarch, and he certainly communicated a lot with the new pope 
among the Coptic Christians in Egypt and certainly has prayed for them and has given them his blessing and given the kind of sympathy that they deserve for the horrors that they're facing. France's simplicity and inclusiveness and belief that everybody is a daughter or son of God made it easy for Francis to talk to the Sultan. The Sultan's a brother. May have funny clothes on, but ultimately he's a brother. He may not believe exactly what I believe. I may want, even want to try to persuade him to believe what I believe, but he's a brother. You do it as with somebody you love. It's also made it easy for Pope Francis to talk in interreligious dialogue. As I said, he wrote a book with the rabbi, the chief rabbi of Buenos Aires. A book that nobody read until he was elected pope, by the way. And now, of course, you can find it in, you know, Finnish and, you know, a hundred other languages, probably. It's a wonderful little book. And Francis, the pope, even once spoke about our brothers and sisters, the atheists. Well, of course he did, because they're brothers and sisters of God, too. So, certainly, when this pope chose the name of Francis, he was taking a big risk because he knows what the comparisons are going to be. The standards are going to be high. Everybody's going to think they have some knowledge of Francis by which to judge him. But I think he did it purposely because he knew this saint and he knew that if he could creatively take what he learned from Francis of Assisi and apply it as the Bishop of Rome to the universal church, that would be what he wants his pontificate to be about. He doesn't live literally like St. Francis, but he lives simply. He's a highly educated man. Francis probably had what we would call an eighth grade education. And Francis was a terrible administrator of the order that he founded, so much so that his own brothers kind of fired him. This pope is in charge of a huge and opaque bureaucracy. And yet Francis the pope wants to say, I want to take what I've learned from this great saint and I want to figure out ways to live that way in the position I'm in as the Bishop of Rome, as the Vicar of Christ. Very few people paid any attention to why Pope Benedict chose the name Benedict or why Pius XII became Pius XII because very few people know about Pius XI or Benedict XV. And so it's easy. Nobody says, boy, that Cardinal Ratzinger, boy, he's failing here because look what Pope Benedict XIII did. People don't know about Pope Benedict XIII. Scholars don't know about Pope Benedict XIII. But when you choose the name Francis, everybody's watching, everybody's looking, everybody's going to have an opinion, everybody's going to try to make a comparison. And yet, I think despite the fact that he sort of called attention and said, you know, watch me, so far, and by the way, next week will be the second anniversary of his becoming pope. Doesn't it seem like he's been pope longer? That I think what we see is a man that really is changing the face of the church, taking a piece of its most sacred history and tradition with St. Francis and being one of the most creative users of the past I know in trying to figure out what does it mean to be a Franciscan pope. So those are some thoughts. Maybe we have time for some questions.